just for those people that don't sit already. Um, so basically, Fireside Chat is um, the audience asking questions, speakers trying to do their best to answer, and um, so let's just see a hand if anybody has questions on Android. on the topics that were presented today or anything else. M May I? Hi, I'm Stefan. I don't know if we met with everyone. Um, I have a more general question, not necessarily on the topics that were discussed. Um, in, the, in the last half a year or so, let's say a year, Google has turned more from making big releases of the new Android versions into pushing it kind of like on the side, releasing whenever they feel like it, not making a big media event out of it, and focusing more on extending the Google Play services and packing as much power as possible into the Google Play services so that it is said they can control more from the distance what actually is happening on the phone. Do you think, um, are you all, <laughs> that this is heading towards a less open source future for Android. The, the AOSP, so the open source version of Android that is available right now is pretty limited as compared to what we can get on an Android phone today when we remove all the Google stuff. Galaxy Nexus, which is uh, still a fairly nice device. It's not going to get Android for 4. And uh, Nexus S, Nexus 1, and those devices, which used to be very awesome, um, don't get updates anyway. And uh, Google Play Service is one way to actually tackle that, because as soon as you basically can download those libraries, which Google Play Service does for you, um, you can still assess features like uh, geofencing, which is awesome, right? So. New functionality is being pushed to old devices, but on the other hand, Google is pushing more uh, other applications like the keyboard uh, to be Play Store. The gallery is now being replaced by the Google Plus photo application, Hangouts instead of SMS, and uh, some apps which used to be in the AOSP, like SMS, don't have the same quality like the apps that are now in the Play, uh, uh, Play Store. So yes, um, I think that AOSP at some point is going to lack of quality. Um, but on the other hand, it's not just Google actually pushing Android, right? Like, at least that's not how it's designed to be. So I think if you, um, if you look at what the manufacturers do, like Samsung, they have alternatives to those applications that Google has. They are just often not as great as those applications. Like, if you check out the Google, uh, sorry, the Samsung uh, SMS apps and those apps, that's not Hangouts. And um, it's okay, it's just not as great. But maybe some other speakers, give me an offer. You did an excellent job. <laughs> what are um, Yeah, I'd like to add a little something. Of course, it will lead to a more closed uh, Android in my eyes, in parts. But um, there is this nice thing that's called um, cloning an API. And this is possible so you can clone the API and write the, s the services yourself. Actually, nobody started this because it's a big project and it's a very ambitious, but I'd rather much see Google open sourcing parts of that as well because um, one thing I really like about Android is that it's been open, very open from the be very beginning, um, and I'd, I'd like to see this continue in the future, that it still is an open platform and not Google closing closing it in. Yeah, so to, to help Android kind of staying open, um, write more open source software. I know if, if you work for a company, you probably can't open source your stuff and you will use the Play services because it's convenient, because users want it. But uh, basic software, we should have at least open source alternatives um, 
there are great open source projects. There are open source, really open source uh, Android distributions. Um, if you can, use them, tell others about them. Uh, there's this great project called AppDroid. They are basically the Play Store for, open, uh, for free software. So um, if you don't want to use Google services, uh, look into AppDroid, look into uh, alternative Android distributions like CyanogenMod um, and contribute to you know, the open source world. Uh, that way we have some kind of counterbalance to all this proprietary stuff. And of course it's in, in Google's interest to, to control the platform, but we also want open software. And if we can bo uh, bring both worlds together, that's even better. So um, expose functionality in your apps. Um, maybe we can uh, c uh, continue on the topic. Uh, some of you already mentioned the uh, tracking service. When I implement some tracking feature, I always ask myself, use the uh, AOSP tracking uh, implementation or Google uh, Play tracking implementation. Both do more or less tracking. And um, yeah, uh, what I have now, I have a fallback uh, solution. So I first ask for a uh, Google Play uh, tracking service and if, if it's not available, um, use the AOSP tracking. But um, I still ask myself, it's more or less a feature thing, so I can tell, okay, I'm using Google Play service for tracking because it's cool. Um, but in the end, I ask myself, why should I use it? Because geofencing is nice, but it's not magic. You can implement it on your own very easily uh, with the plain stuff. But somehow I still use the Google Play uh, a service for it. And um, yeah, why should I actually, or wh wh why should I use the old one? And why should I use the used one, uh, the new one? Location tracking, location, location tracking. tracking, yeah. Um, Google did a great job with the, with the geofencing and location tracking. They used the hardware features of the device that um, makes it very low power consuming, which is yeah. really cool. Um, but actually, not all of the users are uh, that, that install applications, especially when they are widely spread, have play services installed. Um, and Fallback solutions are always a good thing. Um, I try always to go with the stuff that's really cool, but also try to um, get the get the people that don't have these proprietary features um, to have a decent solution. Because, like I said, I try to to make it as open as possible. And if there's a proprietary thing that's widely spread, I also support this. It's not that this is the first choice in my eyes. I have a question for you uh, related to testing Android applications because in my <laughs> <laughs> in my previous company we, ha we had more than 20 apps on the Play Store with zero automated testing. In my current uh, company we also have zero automated testing uh, and every time I want to go into automated testing it's all always a pain because I'm using Android Studio uh, and I'm actually using Holo Everywhere library, so Roboelectric doesn't work with it. I cannot make it work. Uh, it's always a pain. Even if I'm trying to do unit testing, it doesn't work. If I try it, now I'm trying to use Espresso, the new Android uh, library to test, so it's really new. I, I, I really need to get into it, but the instrumentation testing of Android was a pain. UI Automator was much better, but also a pain, so what kind of testing do you do? Do you test the activities, the services, the content providers? What kind of testing do you do? Uh, what we do in our company is both in the technical side and the functional side. So um, that's normal with the older applications for Java. Uh, that's normal. It's the same for Android. And it's still one of the biggest pains in Google world in this, um, supplying good testing frameworks. There are a couple of out there. Um, Espresso is really the way to go for your functional testing um, and I think with the last quick test they improved the instrumental test runner also so uh, still focus on that and use Espresso. Okay, we c uh, actually it, it 
using Espresso was also a pain because the first test I tried to write, I couldn't make it work and I sent um, an email to Valera, the guy that I think that created or it's actually inside that project and he told me that it's impossible to do my first basic test. We just, uh, I tried to load the activity and chose a spinner to show the user that something is loading and I wanted to test that after something finishes loading, the spinner actually goes away. It was such a basic test, it's not possible for Expresso. And you can't use this little like RoboLetric where you say wait until or wait? I haven't tried RoboLetric because it fails, uh, because Holo Everywhere has a startup mechanism that apparently RoboLetric doesn't deal with it that well. So I cannot even write a basic RoboLetric test. Hollow Everywhere, for those that don't, don't know the library, makes the, your app look the same in all versions of Android. Okay. So even if you are using 2.1 or 2.2, it has the same look and feel as Jelly Bean. Okay, so it's more a specific problem in that you can't run any framework? In case of Roboletic, yes, but in case of Expresso, it's because if the spinner is uh, running, it has, uh, it's using the UI thread and uh, since Expresso also uses the runs in the UI thread, it cannot intercept uh, the loading process. So I, I would need to fake the, the loading. And maybe create a wrapper around it with a runnable also? Yeah, something like that. So I think that doing a lot more code just to be able to test uh, such a basic feature, I just look at it and see if it works or not. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, very recent, so I yeah. still need to. Google is pushing the uh, Expresso framework and not the uh, UI automatic. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else want to? Um, so Expresso is still very early in its stages, so there are many hassles. Like you have to write s several tests for several API levels in some part. This is going to change to some extent. Um, if you can't do uh, RoboLetric tests, that's partly bad because um, unit testing is, a, is essential. I don't know why they didn't fix that in, in Holo Everywhere, um, but in my eyes, I don't think that uh, devices that don't support Holo actually need Holo UI because that looks and feels a little odd. It is a, it is a way to go, so it, it is a valid thing to say I want this to look and feel everywhere the same, but it actually, if, if it doesn't feel like it's on the device, like it's native app um, and also holo and non-holo devices, feels a little strange. Um, on the other hand, for, for um, UI testing, you could use, um, of course, Lubotion, which is very good. It's not as fast as Espresso, but it's solid. It's been tested by many, many people. Um, it is still developed and it works pretty good. Um, and you can even speed up the tests. They don't accept pull requests. I don't know why, especially for the features that speed up the tests, but um, they use waiting, so they just wait for a new UI element to appear, and you can speed that up by decreasing the loop time or just by automatic waiting, so I'd say just wait for uh, a couple of milliseconds and then try and look if it's there, and if it hits the, your absolute limit of waiting time, then it should fail. Before that, it should not. So this is another thing. Yeah, but uh, those kinds of tests, you, you cannot deal with them during development time because uh, you cannot go through the loop of seeing green, okay, uh, now it's red and trying to fix it because the robo robot team tests uh, take too long. First, because they run in the emulator, uh, unless you have always a device plugged. I actually only d develop on, uh, on my device because using uh, the emulator is super slow. Have you seen Genie Motion? No, not yet. That is awesome. I I've seen it on the uh, on the uh, Droidcon in London, and I've been playing around with it. And you can download uh, any emulators you want. So and the fun thing is they have play services, so they work. You can log in with your existing accounts or create a new one, and they boot up in less than ten seconds, at least on my machine. So. That's pretty fast, and they react, they respond, they're really, really good. So for me, it's right now 
Uh, do I want to get my Nexus tablet out of my bag or do I just boot up the emulator? Okay, uh, because uh, since I'm using uh, Ubuntu and not Windows or Apple? It doesn't matter. Ah, okay. It doesn't matter. It, is a, it runs in a virtual machine, in a virtual box, and it's perfect. Okay, nice. Yeah, what I was saying is uh, if you need, you will think about if you really need Holo everywhere. If you need really robot, uh, RoboLectric is something is really useful. So maybe the problem is not RoboLectric, but using Holo everywhere. Of course, yes. Inside. And yes, for Robotium, use Genymotion. It's really, really fast. Uh, it will be much improvement for what, you are, for what you're doing now. But yeah, for, for what we do normally, it's just unit testing, RoboLectric, uh, and then instrumentation test. I haven't played myself with Espresso, but mm -hmm. I feel like it's really, really good. So if it's fast and it's continue being developed, just I think that's the way to go. Okay. Yeah, but uh, you shame on you for not having tests. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really. Uh, but uh, just uh, one more thing. Uh, actually, uh, using Holo Everywhere was a design decision. So at this point, it's uh, I cannot remove it. But I've convinced management just because of the testing that once 2.3 kind of fades into oblivion. I will remove all the Holo Everywhere stuff because it will start stop making sense. Obviously, I've already removed Action Bar Sherlock and moved to the Action Bar Combat because Holo Everywhere dropped Action Bar Sherlock and moved to Action Bar Combat. So, so you make him very happy. <laughs> uh, did you have a look at Calabash and Selenium grids as well? Uh, I tried Calabash, but I couldn't make it run on my office PC. Actually, it worked on my computer, on my personal computer. So was some Ruby dependency that didn't work? Yeah, it's, it's exactly. So it, it depends on Ruby, like heavily. Um, but I think it makes sense. So I know since um, Dominic Derry, one of my colleagues from eBay, is actually actively working on Calabash for Android. It works really well if you want to have a test grid and not just single devices. Because you're not just interested on running it on each and every device separately. Mm -hmm. You want to even automate that process, right? Because yeah. you have your Jenkins somewhere and you have your Selenium running somewhere. And you want to make sure that you assess everything on the same level. And also, not everybody has the big advantage of actually having test engineers who know how to really program. So those abstractions like Cucumber and these things that exist help non-developers actually writing tests. So yeah, it, it was actually good. I showed the Calabash to one of my uh, to one of the product managers to, can you please read, the, read this test to see what it does? And uh, he was re actually really happy because, oh, I could actually write this my, myself. So I could delegate the testing process to, to managers because Calabash is perfectly human readable. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, also, I'm another person who can recommend you using the robot team. Uh, I got some experience using it and uh, even better than running on, in on Genemotion you can set up a continuous integration server that will execute those tests uh, automatically in the background. So you don't even uh, need to, to think about them. You, you will get notified if some, uh, something fails. And about the RoboLectric, I think it's not the best tool for testing things like activities, fragments, or the, or the UI things. Uh, partially because of its problems with, for example, Holo Everywhere and in the past with the Action Bar, Sherlock. And yeah, what I can recommend you is just to try to keep as much logic, uh, business logic as you can uh, from the uh, activities and fragments and UI components and test them separately using RoboLectric because you probably still have uh, some dependencies to the Android SDK that need to be mocked in order to uh, avoid the runtime exception. But uh, if, you, if you use RoboLectric just to, just to uh, test the essential business logic, then you can get like good TDD uh, with uh, fastest, fast test execution. And, and yeah, that, that's my recommendation. Thanks. You, you know why? Because you're not running your, like say, KitKat on a Nokia device. Uh, be unique, like uh, 2.3, uh, it doesn't need to be hollow. Why? The people aren't used to it, so don't force hollow onto it. Yeah, of course, but uh, since the users uh, actually prefer the hollow version, and they didn't complain, so uh, we kept using it.
because well, removing. I don't complain. It's okay. I, I want to remove it, but it's hard to convince uh, management that now I, I need uh, uh, to remove all this code and use only Google code. It's not very easy to convince That's management. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Oh, he's so angry, I can't <laughs> feel it. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> and it was actually my decision, so it's my fault. My bad on me. Yeah, Shame on me again. <laughs> the point is not really whole everywhere. You can also use, for example, theming and styling. You can create a theme which are running on every device and have the same look and feel, and you don't need whole everywhere for that. You can create your custom UI, make your theming, and then it's running everywhere the same style. Yeah, but uh, using whole everywhere, it changes everything automatically for me, all the yeah, dialogues. Yeah, automatically you say it. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's hard to find a design decision or a management decision after it has been implemented. Yeah, so of course. I, I know this, it's not impossible, but at some point, um, one can just hope that 2.3 will at one point just go, go the way of other platform versions. Um, but in the first place, it's important if somebody does design decisions uh, to say, yeah, we want this whole look and feel overall everywhere um, that it should be consistent on all platform versions and just try to convince them otherwise just for, for future projects. It's, it's important to keep consistency there with, the, with what users actually expect. Um, so, two days ago, KitKat came out, right? And probably you all saw some kind of like YouTube film or a specification or even didn't go to sleep and order a Nexus 5. Um, can you tell me the favorite new feature for KitKat that you were excited about? Excited about? <laughs> Starting here. <laughs> <laughs> As already mentioned in my talk, I like the storage access framework that unifies, you know, selecting content. Um, also, the, the printer framework uh, looked nice at a first uh, inspection. I don't know how usable it will be, but let's hope for the best. I don't want to print myself. I have a printer in the... He prints the whole internet. Print. Uh, although it's available from API level 19, uh, try catch these resources and uh, Java 7 features are really, really nice. I can like query my content resolver and get cursor and don't worry about checking if this cursor is null and then finally close it and do sad, sad, sad things. And also, uh, I was a little worried about about what direction Google will take uh, about about Java because we got already uh, Java seven for years, and we are about to get Java eight with some cool features like uh, almost Yoda time integration, and the Lambda, <laughs> and many other features. And I was thinking, okay, uh, my friends from the backend team will be happy and will be using it and I will be stuck in like Java 6 for another 20 years. But now, as they, as they started to support the Java 7, I can see that something is going in the right direction and maybe not that far away from the Java 8 stable release and uh, we'll get it also supported on Android. And also the documents provider uh, is also very nice and mm, we are thinking about Integrating it with with uh, within our app. So I'm the TV guy here, and yeah. Then for me, the best thing about KitKat for now is I didn't look all the stuff up yet, but for now it's the IR blaster. Although I cannot even test it, right? Because <laughs> Nexus 5 doesn't didn't have the doesn't have the hardware for it. So I'm looking for a device I can test it. 
weeks, we start um, with put a little energy, they make lots of improvements with that, we start contacting, so it seems like smart devices are a thing and uh, lots of friends are coming up with Jawbone and all of these devices. So ha not just having sensors in your phone, but also external ones supporting them quite well. That is really awesome. And um, one thing which lots of people interpreted as supporting shitty devices from China with 512 megabytes, <laughs> for me it doesn't just mean you support low, low end phones. It also so means supporting smartwatches and all that stuff with Android 4.4. Because lots of those watches that you see nowadays that run with Android, they run with a version of 1.6 because that thing still works with that, that less than. And if Google is ever going to bring out a smartwatch, which they will be, I guess, and Google Glass and all that these things, they ac actually made a big milestone in pushing out a version with Android 4.4, which could run on those devices. Yeah, was the name was KitKat, you said? Is yeah. Are you looking for KitKat? Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, can I reply? Um, Jingle? No. no. So for me, uh, since I've been working with the media player lately, uh, I guess with all the improvements that they are working on it, uh, we had a lot of trouble supporting uh, HLS streams on 2.3 devices, which actually doesn't work. And hopefully uh, taking a step forward on the media player uh, will let us to for see more fully uh, control, like, how do you explain it? Uh, make much more quality on the videos that we can stream uh, and how we can display it. And also with second screen helpers, I think there's also improvements uh, for Chromecast and KitKat and whatever. So for what I've been using, I think that's media play will be the go for me. And you didn't tell which was your favorite. Uh, you okay, okay. Uh, yeah, so a lot of the stuff that, that already has <laughs> been said, I, I really like that. I also like the possibility to go um, really full screen, not the one with the black dots at the bottom, but the immersive mode, which is um, kind of a good thing for some parts, but not for any everything within an app, but there are some, some valid use cases for that. Um, also the possibility to, to go down to low order devices. And there is this thing, the, the new compiler, the um, runtime compiler, ART, ART, um, which should make everything a little, more, a little faster or even much faster. I'm looking forward to seeing that in action what's going on there. Um, is that me? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, this is, um, <laughs> this, I, I don't like that, but uh, yeah, we've got, and now we've got porn DPI with uh, three axes, which is really, uh, so level 20 is four, level 21 is five. Um, yeah, we're gonna get a lot of axes in there. <laughs> like supersizing your resource pile. Um, Obviously, the the name I got an overdose of sweets KitKat. Um, so that's good. I'm a diabetic, so that's bad. And I really like the new framework for transitions. So basically, you have two fragments or you have two activities, and you can easily define the transition between the different states and give it an amazing uh, amazing animation. Obviously, I'm the UX guy here now only. Today <laughs> on the panel, sort of. But it's good, right? <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, I have uh, one more. All developers I've talked to, uh, Android developers, use networking in a different way. Some people use async tests, some people use loaders, some people use a random library. In my previous company, we were using aspect oriented programming everywhere to do the networking to automatically put the spinners, everything, with the one annotation. Um, what do you guys use for networking? Because in all Android apps, we have to write everything. It, it should be like a one-click process to create one activity that goes to the network, puts the spinner, gets the results, and shows everything with like one line of code. And uh, Activities you rotate the, the phone, it crashes the app because the app is not there to get the response. Uh, you can use the new way of loaders, but the loaders are more for loading uh, from the database, and some people use services. I, I, I'm sure that some of you use different uh, ways. 
So uh, we have this library called EventBus, and yeah, we are, we are basically ev using it everywhere. So um, yeah, you just have to uh, yeah, it has this class async executor, and you just have to post a runnable on it, and in the runnable you post an event, and it calls back automatically to the main thread, and that's it. Google I.O. 2011, I guess, there was a presentation by the guy, I can't really spell his name. Because yeah, I saw that one about the sync adapters. And that presentation yeah. was about sync adapters. And in my opinion, there is really no big reason in the Android application architecture to connect the network within the, within the app TVs. Uh, what, what you should probably want to want to use is try to use those sync adapters and try to expose the content providers and using the service that that is going by a sync adapter write data to that uh, to that content provider and connect your activities and fragments to that content using uh, using loaders uh, but if you really need to connect uh, Without, without, for example, sync adapter, uh, the worst thing you can probably do is uh, is using async task for that. Maybe, maybe even worse well, it is like a rough thread. But you can use loaders. Uh, they are fine. Uh, you don't have to worry that much about contact leakage because once you, for example, swipe your phone, the loader manager uh, frees the loader callbacks and your loader can be still going and if result will be there will be cached so you don't have to worry about the activities leaks uh, other um, other solution could be to use services and to um, and to con um, communicate with your uh, with your UI components using for example content providers or something like broadcast receivers or do some service connection I think you should never tend to, to, to use async task for sure uh, to, to load such, such data. I think I agree with the async task because you have issues like what if an error occurs, do you just return an empty string because you, are yeah. you have to return a string and all these things, right? Or you have to really define which data types you have. Uh, I like the event bus idea a lot. And one thing that I recently saw um, just broke from London was uh, Rx Java. So um, that's like what I, I do a lot of Node.js right now nowadays. And we have on error, on success, all these different channels basically where my output comes through. And um, they have the same kind of approach. So it's very minimal minimalistic what you actually have to write to do have access to different kind of uh, replies. So that approach is really nice and you don't have to care about threading and all that stuff because the library takes care of that. So I like that a lot. Um, I like the whole event-driven approach, which EventBus does as well. So I'd rather register my activity for results and deregister it on, an, on this board than having an activity starting a thread and I have to wait until the user basically uh, has his data and I block the activity with a progress dialog until he can actually do something. So I think Rita Maya and all those guys always say application should work like magic, right? So they shouldn't block access, they shouldn't block anything until you deliver it you through your API or whatever you want to show. So uh, I think that is a really nice approach. So either Event Bus or Rx Java are worth having a look at. Yeah, it's just a really nice talk about Matthias in Doicon London last week with LX Java in SoundCloud, which really, really, I'm really excited about it. Uh, what we do is we use loaders to get the data from a content provider, uh, and that's going to the activity. So you have the presentation layer, which is only basically getting data from the content provider, and then it's the background task that the loader is using to insert the data on, on the provider. So there's also a library, uh, it's called the SQLite provider. We did it in Novoda. Uh, and that's kind of mixing SQLite with content providers to make it really easy to, to use. Uh, um, that's what we've been using. And also we're using Auto uh, as the event bus. Uh, and it's quite, yeah, quite worth a while.
Yeah, um, I think most of us have tried playing with n event bus. So there are several implementations. Uh, we chose event bus. Um, agree that it's way more fun doing this than other stuff, uh, other ways of, of passing around da data, except for intents that are really useful themselves. But you can get rid of listeners with them as well, which is really cool because um, I, I don't know who said this, but it's it's really a good way to, to try this. Listeners are the come froms, so it's not the go-to, but the come from, and you have to wait and you have to um, retain your all your stuff. So you don't want to do that. And on the other hand, uh, no matter what technology you actually use for, for creating your um, network, create it in a separate layer that just communicates very loosely with your UI stuff. Because the whole processes that are on the network are doing data, uh, doing I.O. or something else, they should not block the user in any way. Yeah, uh, well two uh, frameworks that are actually, one by Square that was uh, was a retrofit. I think it's actually really good because it makes your REST API um, fully statically typed. I think that's really good. And uh, on top of that, uh, I think some French guys created the RoboSpice. I don't know if you have heard about RoboSpice, but I'm actually going to look into it because it's like networking on steroids. Yeah, they presented RoboSpice and also has like a retrofit plugin. Uh, yeah, there's so a retrofit. Yeah. Also in, in their con I haven't used it, but I guess at the end you have different layers on your application. You're more than yeah, and going to use they are using uh, services uh, for yeah. for the networking. Mm -hmm. And uh, about uh, the event bus, you are talking about the real event bus or auto as an event bus? I'm talking about Otto. Okay, because one of the problems that I had in Otto is that it doesn't uh, scale the class hierarchy. So, uh, if you ac let's say if you have uh, an annotation in a in a superclass, if you extend that class, uh, the the child doesn't get the the event. So, yeah, and event bus handles that, but Otto doesn't. Yeah. What we do is use Otto with Tagger, uh, so you can inject the bus. Uh, okay. Okay. Just hold the mic. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, we we have touched already the the networking topic. Um, surprisingly enough, Android is a operating system for mobile devices, but the HTTP implementation really is a pain in the ass since version 1.6 and the result is that I have a lot of glue code for and a lot of switches so if it's Froyo or older I have to set uh, request properties on very low level like keep alive false um, this is something I don't I should not do on newer versions because I get uh, socket exceptions on some devices so I have a lot of uh, switch and uh, yeah, SDK level related code and I am somehow forced to use um, like things like Volley because they take care if to take uh, HTTP URL connection or something else. And um, yeah, what's the general approach to overcome this HTTP things <laughs> problems? In API level 14. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, this is not always uh, possible. Uh, if the client uh, thinks we have to uh, support 99.9% .9 of the applications uh, out there. And <laughs> yes, but you don't want to pay for uh, supporting uh, all the devices. But yeah, do you have the same feelings? Or uh, because I just uh, last week I get new exceptions where I have to set other request properties for some specific devices, really low level stuff. I actually. It's okay that I'm able to do it, but I don't want to take care of this. And it's quite surprising for a mobile operating system having those kind of issues. I know that feeling. I've been working with the HTTP stuff from the mm. early versions, and I know that there are mm. lots of bugs that got fixed with Froyo, I think. Mm. Um, so there's probably, you mentioned it already, there's mm. OK HTTP. Um, mm -hmm. There is tools around there that make basically this approach easier since you don't just have to write the glue code. Mm. There's lots of people actually writing glue code and lots of people review it. So like it makes sense to use a distro from source libraries for like mm. like for nearly everything else. Um, so we basically uh, at PayPal at 
sometimes just decided, well, we don't have to support 99.9% yeah. .9 of apps, and let's go for 98, yeah. and just did this reality re instead. <laughs> Again, yeah. either use existing libraries, uh, use existing libraries and push and be API targeted up anyway, because it's not just the HTTP stack which sucks. Yeah. And also, I think you just uh, basically gave a valid answer why you shouldn't use the Rubber anymore if you come up with different exotic exceptions which only ha like exist on very exotic old devices. Shouldn't that be already an answer why you shouldn't use Quantix anymore? Right? Like yeah. if you have to set request properties and you have lots of if, as, if, if, yeah. and if that's this manufacturer, right? Yeah. I think that's a lot of reason to actually not stick with those versions anymore. Yeah. yeah, of course, I see this applications having its own Apache implementations and uh, its own uh, Java X uh, libraries and so on. <laughs> yes, uh, things like this. Uh, yeah, Bouncy Castle is a good example because I still get uh, class not found exceptions for some uh, encryption implementation, which then the user tells me something doesn't work. And uh, yeah, encryption and network is always a big topic on mobile devices, but it still doesn't work. So uh, just a last question. So are you actually, you of you, dealing with HTTP URL connection or you ju are you just using uh, libraries, event bus or volley or whatever? Uh, so HTTP URL connection, mm -hmm. as far as I remember, is in the interface. And yeah. if you use the OK mm -hmm. HTTP uh, based on the Android version mm -hmm. you are running, it returns the proper instance right. that should yeah. work. And for our case, it works since prior because we support <coughs> prior. And uh, yeah, but still dealing with HTTP URL connection is a little messy mm. because there are like a lot of exceptions that can be can be drawn, and you need to access some URL, for example, or have input stream to mm -hmm. to grab those data. And there is a library called, if I remember correctly, HTTP request, and it's written by the Kevin Savitsky from GitHub, mm -hmm. and it works with the, there is like OK HTTP client that supports HTTP requests, which expose some fluent APIs. So dealing with HTTP is not a nightmare anymore, mm. both in the functional, not throwing runtime weird errors, and both uh, in the fluent syntax uh, of the API. So you might want to uh, check, check this out. I want to add one thing for KitKat. I think ADB screen record is pretty awesome. And I, I want to uh, ask everyone of you, some of you already uh, answered, uh, what's your min SDK version for your main project, <laughs> for your biggest one? We at K9 we're switching to min SDK, I guess, 15, because we looked at the stats and nobody's using 14, so, so no devices. But yeah. 14 plus. Eight. <laughs> <laughs>
seven as well. Huh? Actually, I would have another question, sorry that I'm uh, talking that much, but we have a KitKat thing as well, which changed, I'm not sure if it's true or not, um, the ADB lockhead thing changed on KitKat. So before, you had this permission uh, read locks, so you were able to read all locks, and with uh, KitKat, you don't need the permission any longer, but you can get get just the lock output from your application. So they do some masking on the package namespace, uh, probably, um, just as one information. And the uh, the question arising on this, what are you using for error reporting? So when the application crashes, of course, there's this Google uh, service where you can look in the Play Store what kind of crashes you get. But sometimes you would like to have more uh, output, some context information. Of course, depending on the application, users are always a bit scared to send you uh, lock information. So what's your general approach for hunting bugs which are in production environment, not during development, but in production envi environment? Uh, within our company, we just mm. use the development console because okay. we don't, it's a privacy thing. Mm. We don't want We don't have production bugs. Uh, of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, for real, um, we, we've got a possibility. Well, let them roast. Okay, I have a challenge for you. If you can find a production bug, I'm not gonna send you a Nexus 5, but I'm gonna send you this t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and, and send him the error as well and help him solve it. No one wants your shirt, right? We have it on. <laughs> what if I find the bug? Can I have the shirt? Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> um, actually, uh, we, we've got a possibility for users to opt out and use hockey. Okay. So it's it's working pretty good, and uh, there are several other things. There is open source. There are open source implementations that have even a server there. Um, you, many of them are there. Using bug sense, mm. and then they have been playing Crashlytics, which is mm -hmm. something from Twitter. I think Twitter bought it. Uh, it has like nice Gradle integration, but uh, so far I've never found. Uh, we're sticking with bug sense so far. Could also have a look at Criticism. That's mm -hmm. another really great service. They have a wonderful dashboard. It's really cool. So um, uh, check them out. Mm. So we are using for one customer project right now uh, Crashlytics, but there's no preference for a special one. Uh, we use a Google Analytics, and we also start to use uh, Flurry because our uh, mm, big data team is integration, you know, is in integrating <coughs> to the Flurry API, mm -hmm. so we get like some kind of facade that is mirroring even as well to Google Analytics <laughs> and, and Flurry. I'm not sure if it's an option for you, but there's an open source library called Aqua, I guess. <laughs> Android crash reporting something. Mm -hmm. um, and it has a couple of options to, to send you the crash reports. Mm. Uh, one of them is email, which seems kind of odd because nobody wants to send an email to send a crash report. But I used it in, in one of my private apps um, because I didn't want to request the internet permission because this app deals with contacts. Mm. And the users really like that. Okay. Acra. A C R A. Okay. And I never received a bug report, so I'm I'm, I'm not sure, sure if <laughs> <laughs> there's a relation. Uh, How many downloads? It, maybe two thousand or three thousand. I have to check. So it's it's not really a big app and doesn't have a user interface, so. Um, there's, there's not much that can go wrong. Maybe you forgot to, maybe it's mocked or, or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course, I tested it. I planted a bug. 
and then sent myself an email with Kina in it, which is great. Use it. <laughs> it's open source. If, if you could decide on one feature for the next Android version, which would it be? Sorry, I think we've finished already this time slot today. I'm you can ask us later on on the sea base. You are everyone is invited to go there, drink some beer or something else, have a nice chat with every speaker or attendee. And then thank you very much for all speakers today here in the Android arena. It was really amazing that you was here. It was fun to hear all of you. And thank you very much. And and, and before you clap, I also want to, uh, on behalf of all the speakers, want to thank the organization for such a really great event. Uh, we flew right at home and great audience. So if you're clapping, clap for yourself also.